In episode 006, I told you that we couldn't use Azure's free app service tier F1 unless we were using the Windows operating system to run the app service. Now that's not a big deal if we're using Node or Python, Java, .NET, and we're happy to use Azure's canned hosting engine. But what if we want to orchestrate things ourselves? What if we want to do something with Docker? Unfortunately, if we want to run Docker on Azure, then we have to use Linux. And Linux on Azure, well, that wasn't free. Not then, but it is now. This is very exciting. Two weeks ago, I was at Microsoft's Build Conference, Build 2019, watching my old boss's boss, Scott Guthrie, or Scott Goo, who's actually now my boss's 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 boss, something like that. Anyway, he was announcing all the fun things that were coming for Azure. About 30 or so minutes into his keynote, Scott Guthrie announced a perpetual free tier for Azure App Services on Linux. And that is really big news, especially for us, the people that want to run Docker on Azure. So why is this big news? Well, it's outstanding for developers who want to be sure their clients can see their work and for developers who really like orchestrating things with Docker. Now, before we get going, it's important to understand that there are limitations, of course, on the free tier, and they're the same as they are with the Windows operating system free tier. You have one gig of total disk space. You have right around a gig of RAM, only one instance allowed, and so no scaling is possible, no custom domains, and your app service will also spin down and need to be spun back up if it hasn't been used in a while. For development and testing, however, this is ideal. But here's the best part to me. You don't need to worry about using file-based databases like we did in episode 006, or fake services either. App Services on Linux supports containerized web applications, including multi-container applications, using Docker Compose or Kubernetes. That is what I built for this week's Azure Cast, a super simple web app using Elixir connected to Redis. I'm simply outputting a hello message with the result of a Redis ping command, which replies the string pong. The Elixir app that I'm making here is just like the Node app that I created in episode 001. It is as simple as I can possibly make it. There's no frameworks involved. It's just the sample code from this tutorial up at Elixir School. As you can see, this uses Elixir's plug module to generate a simple response. If you want to know more, you can review all this code in our GitHub repo, but I'm not going to be explaining much more about Elixir. To get all this running, I decided to use Docker Compose to create the Redis instance as well as run my Elixir app, which is what you see here. There's nothing overly complicated about it, which is exactly the way I want it for right now. Now you might be wondering, why am I making this so overly simplistic? Isn't that kind of my thing? I hate the Hello World simple demos. And that is true. I am well aware that this is not an optimal development setup. But the development is not my focus. My focus is on Azure. And as I keep saying in these screencasts, I want to keep everything as simple as I can in my code so that if I run into an error with Azure, I can be as sure as I possibly can be that the error is not coming from my code, but instead it's coming from my misunderstanding of Azure. All right, that said, here is my Docker file that is being built for my Elixir app. Again, nothing terribly complicated here if you know Elixir. However, there is one thing to draw your attention to, which you might have noticed in my Docker Compose.yml file. That is that I need underscore need to use port 8080, and I'll explain more about that later on. All right, let's fire it up and make sure that everything works. And it does. Hey, with enough practice, you too can make screencasts. All right, the final thing to do is to push this Docker image up to Docker Hub. I'll build it with the tag Rob Connery 009 Elixir and then do a Docker push. And up it goes. But why didn't I just push this to Docker Hub? Well, if you recall from episode 001, if I'm going to use Docker with Azure, well, Azure needs to be able to have access to my Docker image. My Docker Compose.yml file is building my application's Docker image for me locally here. Now, this is great, but Azure won't do this because it doesn't have access to my code. So it needs to have access to my image somehow. I need to have a way to tell Docker Compose and therefore Azure how and where to get my application's Docker image. So that's why I pushed it to Docker Hub. That's where Azure is going to pull it from. Now, the good news is I can orchestrate this in my Docker Compose file if I want to with this line right here. Except instead of using build, I'm going to use an 
image command, and I'm pointing that at Docker Hub. Now this is going to work just fine up in Azure, but it's not going to work for me here locally. So to get around this, I'll create a dedicated Docker Compose file just for Azure with some small changes, as you can see. All right, now let's push everything to Azure. And as you probably know by now, I am a huge fan of the CLI, primarily because I can program it using shell scripts. I'm using Bash on my Mac, but you can do the same kind of thing I'm doing right here with PowerShell if you want to on Windows. Now here's a script that should look familiar to you if you've seen some of my previous Azure Cast episodes. I have a variable block set up at the top here, specifying my resource group, application name, location, and SKU, which is F1 for free. Yes, freedom! We could use this script if we wanted. In fact, I've added it to the source code for this episode, but I find that using make is much more fun and also very useful. So let's flip this over to a make file. Again, this should look familiar to you if you've been watching the Azure Cast episodes, specifically episode 005. The main difference with this make file, however, is the free SKU that I'm using, F1, and that I'm sending up a Docker Compose file, specifically the Docker Compose Azure YML file that I just created. I'm also telling Azure this file is for use with Compose and not Kubernetes. How did I know how to do this? Well, hopefully you know by now. I use the AZ web app create dash dash help to see what kind of Docker settings I could use. And there it was, plain as day. Specifically, multi-container dash config file. And you can see here it's Linux only, but it's the config file for the multi-container apps. This is my Docker compose file. The next is dash dash multi-container config type. Again, this is only for Linux, but it can be compose or cube for Kubernetes. Because I'm using Docker, I want to make sure that container logging is enabled and I can do that with the dash dash docker container logging setting, which I'm going to set to file system. This will also push the log contents to standard out, which will help us troubleshoot messed up deployments and allow me to see what's going on when I push this thing up to Azure. Okay, let's see if this works. I'll execute this file using make with two pipes, which is an or in bash, or make rollback. This is why I like using make for this kind of thing. If any targets error out, the rollback target will be fired, which will drop the entire resource group. Again, I talk about all of this in episode 005. All right, up it goes. And looks like the resources were built without a problem. I kind of skipped ahead a little bit, if you couldn't tell. However, now we get to wait. So for people like me, who are familiar with Azure's non-Docker app services, which I showed in the last episode, or services like Heroku or Zite or whatever, this is going to seem incredibly slow. In fact, this whole process took about nine minutes from start to finish. That's a lot. The thing is, though, that there's a lot of pieces involved here. Azure has to create our resources, number one, and then pull down and run each image that we need, all in a service that is pretty small, one gig of RAM, if that, and very limited storage space. Now, this is just a one-time setup, and it's also free. If you just need this for client check-ins, it works like a charm. Now, if you need something faster, well, there's always the regular app service, or you can bump your service up to S1, B1, or whatever. Oh, hey, look at that. We're greeted with the familiar 502 error because our container has been built and it has been started, but there's a lag between the start and our site actually coming online, and this causes the problem. So we just have to wait for a few more minutes until the logs actually finish, showing our containers actually starting up and running. And then we refresh and look at that. I find this really exciting. This is victory. In a matter of minutes, we have an Elixir application hooked up to Redis running in the cloud for free. Now there are a few more things we can do here, of course, but I'm gonna save that for a later episode because right now I feel like celebrating taking the rest of the day off. This is amazing to me. Okay, before I do that and take the rest of the day off, I wanna show you a few things that you should be aware of so you understand kind of what's happening here. Let's jump over to the portal and have a look around. If you click on container settings, you'll see that we have a Docker Compose setup, which is in preview currently, and that is really, really important. We're playing around with things that could very well change, and while this is fun, it means that we'll need to be flexible. It also means that things might improve a lot over our experience right now, and to be negative, <laughs> it also means that some things might be confusing or broken. Either way, we need to be patient. Here's another setting that's super important, repository access. 
If you're creating an application for work or for a client, it's likely that they won't want it findable on Docker Hub or publicly accessible, so you're going to need to make it private and good for you. You can set those credentials right here, or if you've learned how to use the CLI, you can ask it for help and figure out how to send them in right through the CLI commands. I'll leave that to you. That's your homework for this week. This next setting is also really, really important for us. It's the webhook URL. This is the URL that your container registry uses whenever you update your image. Now for me, whenever I update my image, Docker Hub is gonna ping this URL right here and it's gonna say, hey, we have a new image. Azure's gonna receive that and say, okay, great. And it will pull it down and update the image that is running in production. The final thing that you're gonna to have to do is to make sure that you've turned on continuous deployment for this to work. You'll also notice that we have access to a Linux version of Kudu, and we talked about Kudu in episode 006. Now it shows most of the same things, but in our case, it's not here to receive Git pushes and synchronize files. What it is doing is handling the webhook URL pings from Docker Hub and kicking off a pull and a restart. We can also start up a bash emulator as you see here, but there are no files in our site directory. It's kind of confusing, isn't it? But it makes sense because we're not actually dealing with files. We are starting our own Docker container. But shouldn't we have access to our files within the Docker container? Can I access my Docker container somehow? What happens if we use a volume with our code, for instance? Can I see that code here? What if we install SSH into our container and I can SSH into it? Again, these are all fun questions, ones that I think I'm going to answer in a later episode. Or maybe I'll make Burke do it. Oh yeah, one last thing. I told you that I needed to use port 8080 earlier, and I mentioned that I would tell you why later on, and I suppose I should do that before we go. The multi-container preview has some limitations. Specifically, certain commands like build and depends on, well, those are ignored. Port settings other than 80 or 8080 are also ignored. Now, I ran into this a few months back as I was trying to get this to work, and I couldn't get anything to work, and I didn't solve it until yesterday when I read this page. And I realized, ports, it's always ports. So if you're doing anything with multi-containers on Azure, make sure you're using port 80 or port 8080. Well, that's it for me. Thank you so much for watching. We dig free stuff.